want to invite you to join me on my weekly podcast called Press On. You can find this podcast on Apple, on Google, on Spotify, anywhere that services podcasts. You can also visit me at AaronRios.com for more information. Good morning, Garden City Church. Good morning, Garden City Church. Good morning, Garden City Church. Good morning, Garden City Church, and welcome to our Sunday celebration service. Welcome to our Sunday celebration service. Here are your announcements. Garden City Church, we're calling for a 21-day fast beginning February 1st through the 21st. February 1st through the 5th, we will be holding prayer in the morning, live streaming it at 9 o'clock a.m. From 6.30 until 8, we will be holding prayer in person here at Garden City Church. From February 6th through the 21st, we will continue to hold prayer, live streaming it every single morning at 9 o'clock a.m. And we'll then be holding a live stream prayer in the evenings at 9 o'clock. If you can join us in person, I know you'll be blessed. If you can join us online, I know that you'll be blessed. Remember, we have several options for fasting. You can intermittent fast, you can modify your diet, or you can do a partial fast. That's excluding one or two meals daily. Whatever you believe the Lord is leading you to do, He is leading all of us to pray and to seek Him more intently. So I want to invite you to join us. God bless you. Calling all men of Garden City Church. Men of the city, Garden City Church Men's Ministry. We'll be kicking off January 31st, from 5 to 7 p.m. Join us for a time of fellowship, prayer, and digging into the Word of God. If you are in middle school or high school, we want to invite you to join our youth group, City Youth Ministry. We meet every Friday at 6.30 through 8.30. We hope to see you. If you are a first-time guest, we would like to invite you to meet with a member of our landing team and Pastor Aaron following service so we can give you a free gift and we can personally welcome you. Be sure to sign up online for our newsletter and text group. This is the easiest way to stay posted on news regarding our church, as well as updates and reminders. We would like to remind you to remain faithful with your giving. Tithes and offerings can be received at the back of the sanctuary or online through our safe and secure web portal at GardenCityChurch.net. Welcome back to Garden City Church Online. Let's dive into today's message. I want to talk to you today about revival. Revival. Can you just lift your hands to the Lord right now and say, Lord, revive me. Revive me once again, oh God. Revive me. The pressures, uh, all that's happening in, in our world, in our politics, in our government, in your personal life, in your marriage. It's designed to dry up your well. So we need the well refreshed. Lord, would you pour back into our lives? We need revival once again. What do we know about revival? What do you know about revival? What comes to your mind when we talk about revival? Beginning with Jonathan Edwards in 1734, first awakening through a second awakening, names like Charles Finney and James McGreedy, William Seymour, pioneers, people that have Uh, touched our world and touched our generation and have historically let off revivals that have created a radical change. Radical change. Historically, revivals have been presented uh, through extended church services, open air meetings, tent meetings. Maybe some of you have been a part of revival services in your church. Maybe it signified a, a time of the year where there was an extended church service and you had a guest speaker. But what is revival? What truly is revival? You know, I'm convinced we often ask God for things that we know not of. (laughs) We don't know what we're praying sometimes. In fact, the Word of God tells us we know not how we ought to pray. We've got to seek the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit will intercede through us. But here's one thing we can be certain of. It is God's will, and I believe it is His heart, to visit with you and breathe revival into your life into your church into your community to revive us again oh god you know when i think of church i don't know about you but i think often i think of organization and affiliation with a group and a community that's something we've longed for coming out of a year like last year everybody wanted to go back to church we missed community we missed the fellowship we missed the interaction But you know, the church is far more than just a community association. The church is the bride of Christ. If you do know that, then we need to then personalize this thing we call revival into 
the people of God. Just think about that again. If I move past the idea that church is community interactions and community affiliation, then when I begin to pray for revival and I look at the church as the bride of Christ, then I imagine a, 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 a young woman out on a stretcher dressed in her bridal attire, her heart barely beating. Maybe the passion for her, uh, her groom ha has gone out. But if we think of it in a life and death terms even, the heartbeat is faint and weak, got the oxygen mask on. And what do we pray? We pray life. We pray for healing. We pray for restoration. If it's regarding passion or love, maybe we're praying that passion would rekindle. I've talked to some of you, some of you regarding your marriages, some of you regarding some of the struggles you're going through, and you're praying for a reviving. I need reviving in my marriage. I need reviving in my passion. I need to be uh, brought back to life again. Something has died and needs to be brought back to life. So spiritually, we can find a lot of verses in scripture and instances where revival came upon people. We need revival today. We need revival today. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ needs revival because much like my vague illustration of a bride laying on a stretcher, I think the church the bride of Christ, we found ourselves on a stretcher. We found ourselves with passion dwindling and maybe our passion and our heart for the Lord is not beating as it should. Acts 13, 19 is a verse I'm gonna be reading out of today. Would you join me? It says, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. True revival is an instance of God's presence and glory revisiting his people. You, you need to write that down. You need to meditate on this. True revival is the instance in which the presence and the glory of God revisits his people for the purpose of healing, affirming and reestablishing his dominion, his lordship, his covenant with you. Do you need a revival? Do you need the revisiting of God's glory? The revisiting of his presence you know, the millennial reign that we read about in the book of Revelation is a, a thousand years of the glory and the reestablishment of God's rule through Christ Jesus. It's a thousand years of revival. Did you ever consider that? Revival comes from the word anathelo, and it's a rare word in the Greek. You know, the Bible was primarily translated from, from Hebrew and from Greek. So anytime uh, I revisit a word in Greek, it's because I want to get to the root meaning and try to have a better understanding of what the author meant when he wrote about such things but we find that that particular word doesn't appear too often in scripture however the concept is at the heartbeat of the gospel that word revival that we find in scripture it means to flourish to live again to bring back to life that is the heartbeat of the gospel god wants to breathe life into you so let, let me just throw this out there god wants you to be revived God wants to visit his church and his people with revival. Carries all throughout scripture. That's what God wants to do. It seems to be the heartbeat of God. So listen, what I pray you would walk away with today is a couple of things. Number one, God residing with man. Walk away with this today. God Walk away with that concept today. God wants to reside with people. I come into my office and I pray. Uh, I try to do it as often as possible. And one of the things I hope for is for the glory, is for his presence, the sense of God residing with me. You know, you can face anything. You can face pandemic, sickness, death, any challenge if you're confident that God's presence is with you. That's one of the things we long for, is it not? What would you prefer? Deliverance out of your problem with maybe a subtle awareness of God's presence or God's presence no matter the problem? What did the angels say when Jesus Christ was born? They sang, uh, Hosanna in the highest peace on earth. Uh, Emmanuel was one of the declarations. God with us. God with us. The establishment of the glory of God in the life of an individual or a people group is an ingredient of revival. Let me say that again. The establishment of his glory in the life of an individual or a people group is an ingredient of revival. Now, I use the word glory. The glory of God. What's the glory of God? The glory of God is God showing off. <laughs> when God's glory shows up, 
understand the glory is simply the introduction. His glory emanates from him. The glory of God emanates from his presence. We're told uh, in the new Jerusalem will emanate with the glory of God. Revelation 21, 11. It says uh, that this new Jerusalem will be adorned or arrayed with the glory of God and that her radiance will be like that of a precious jewel. Revival precedes several ingredients. And I want to just talk about that today. There's ingredients involved in revival. It's a way that you can check whether or not we're in revival. So let me ask you, are you praying for revival? I'm praying for revival. I'm praying for the revivals similar to that of old, but I'm saying, God, do it again, but do something new. Uh, the kind of revivals where people were just sovereignly drawn to the church and drawn to repentance. There's the story of Smith Wigglesworth sitting on a park bench and a, and a man comes and sits alongside uh, next to him and the man begins to weep and Smith Wigglesworth looks over at him and says uh, what's going on uh, is there something is there a problem what's happening and he says sir I, I don't know the moment I, I sat next to you I just became overwhelmed with a sense of sadness I became overwhelmed I can't explain it and Smith Wigglesworth looked over at him and said young man uh, that's called conviction you see the glory of God resides here. The presence of the Lord is here. And the heartbeat of God is to restore you. And so I believe that one of the ingredients to revival, what we're going to begin to see is a sovereign drawing back to humbling ourselves and repenting and seeking God and crying out, visit us again, oh God. Visit us with your power. Visit us with your glory. Father, let your presence come upon us again. Father, we've asked for the miracles. We've asked for signs. We've asked for wonders. But let's move past that. Let's go deeper. We want restoration of your presence in our lives. We want the restoration of right standing, of fellowship with you, God. Once again, oh God, don't just leave us with signs and with wonders and miracles. Don't just leave us with that stuff. Don't leave the church simply with prosperity. Don't leave the church simply in a place where we're doing good. God, we want the restoration of your presence. Would you pray that with me right now? Come on, right now, just extend your hand and say, God, restore unto us your presence, oh God. Oh, Father, I pray that your presence would be restored both back in the church and back in families and communities and homes we need the presence of the Lord I need the presence of the Lord God bring us back to a place where we hunger and thirst for your righteousness once again a couple of ingredients I want to talk to you about today number one are you even alive are you even alive you can't be revived you can't experience revival without having first vival <laughs> you can't revive something that's never lived so really, that's the starting point. Have you ever lived? Has there ever been life infused? Has, has the Holy Spirit ever come upon you? Have you been truly born again? You know, part of my testimony was at the age of 29 years old is when I truly had a, a, a radical born again experience. That's, that's actually kind of terrifying. The reason why is I spent so long believing I was in the right. I... I I believe in I, I was good with God. I was practicing a form of Christianity, but there was no power and there was no evidence in my life. And I could have remained like that, but, but I had an encounter with God. And many of you need a fresh encounter with the Lord. You need to be revived. But before you ever start praying for revival, I, I need to check my pulse and, and ask God, was I ever truly alive? I'm confident many of you might say, yes, yes, I was. But to that one that says, well, I'm not really sure. I've never really experienced uh, the salvation. I've never really been born again. For you, I would say right now, the starting point, before you begin asking for revival, is just ask me to vive me, <laughs> bring me to life. So as leading to this revelation that Peter has in Acts chapter 3, we've got to back up and look at the entirety of what's happening in this story. It begins that Peter and John are walking up to the temple and they find a lame man begging. And the man is asking for, for alms, but rather than meeting that temporal need, that humanitarian need, they go deeper and they meet him with a demonstration of God's power. And then all the people there are shocked and amazed at the demonstration of God's power. And this opens the door for the gospel to be delivered. We can never lose sight of the main purpose of the church 
is not to meet the economic, social needs. It is to be a delivery system of the gospel, but we can use those means as a way of delivering the gospel. That's, that's wildly important. God is not going to pour out his power among people who are not going to demonstrate and allow that power to flow and to move. And so we can become a powerful social force or we can be, become a powerful kingdom force. So I, my heart for Garden City Church is that we can position ourselves to really begin to meet some needs. Just this past week, our church was positioned to be a great blessing in the lives of a couple of families. It was absolutely incredible. But with each deliverance of meeting a need, we also must not neglect ministering the gospel. This is what happens here. So they meet that need, the gospel is delivered, the people are shocked, and the people are forced to make a decision. The line is drawn. The line is drawn. The decision that will determine whether or not revival will come upon them. 2020 presented a, a line in the sand for many churches. What are we willing to do? What are we going to do? Are we going to push in, press in? Are we going to just wait right here? Oh, I, I know 2020 was tough. It was a challenge for my family. It was a challenge for me, just like I'm sure it was for you. But I'm determined that we're not going to settle at the shore like, like the Hebrews on the outskirts of the promised land. We can't just camp out. We've got to go in deeper. Now, after I look at this story, i got to ask, what's wrong with the scenario here? Okay? What's wrong with the scenario in Acts chapter 3? Number one. You got people that are lame and begging at the doorsteps of the temple. Meaning the church is stuck in a routine. The body, the believers, they're stuck in this routine. I go in, I go out. It becomes customary to see people in need all around me. It becomes normalized. So many things have become normalized within the church that ought not be normalized. For instance, the shock of the demonstration of God's power by the virtue that it shocked them. It became normal that God was not moving. We got to check our pulse, right? Talked about revive me, but let me check. Am I even alive? Am I even alive? It has become normal. Do you have any expectation for God to move in church? Do you have any expectation for your loved ones to be saved? Do you have any expectation to see healing, signs, wonders, miracles, deliverance? Do you have any expectation for God to answer your prayers? It's become normalized. Why? We're stuck in a routine. Routine, I show up, pay my, pay my, my alms, pay my tithes, listen to a good message, feel good that I hit a moral obligation, I go home. Their remedy has allowed the normalizing of ineffective ministry and meeting temporal needs. They would rather deal with people on a temporal basis rather than confront true need. Let, let me say that all again, because that was a, a mouthful as I'm reading my notes here, is that those who were within the temple have become comfortable and have normalized ineffective ministry, ineffective faith that only meets the temporal need. Look, a lot of us believe meeting the temporal need is the goal. That's not the goal. The goal is not to put people in beautiful houses and get them food and clothe them so that they'll be uh, full and clothed on their way to hell. The goal is to deliver the gospel, to meet the true need. Peter and John recognized the true need of this lame man. They recognized the true need of the lame man and were prepared and empowered to do that work. The people did not realize they were practicing religion. Everybody else, was, that is the definition of religion, is the normalizing of a lack of a move of God, the normalizing of average the normalizing of no expectation. If you find yourself in a place where there's zero expectation for God to do anything above and beyond, just the average and the ordinary, God is no longer shocking you. He's no longer amazing you. He's no longer surprising you. So many, through their practice, are dead. No longer alive. The call that Peter gave these people was a call to repentance to truly receiving life, receiving Jesus, if you keep reading. I gotta stop there. What have we normalized? I, I'm, I'm afraid that th there's become a normal normalizing of no life, no growth, no expectation. 
Oh, that God would revive me with hope, with growth, with expectation. I need this word. I don't know about you, but, but we've become comfortable. And so we normalize the comfort because it's good enough. That's, that's not how it works. If my body stopped growing at five years of age, and I say, that's good enough. You grew enough. You know, uh, stop growing at 20. Good enough. The moment you, you believe you're good enough is the moment you start dying. We're not good enough. I'm not talking about your self-worth and I'm not talking about your value. I'm talking about digging into the riches of what God has for you. Before the Lord, yeah, you're good enough. God loves you. Oh, Jesus loves you so much. And because of that, there's an extended offer to press in and go deeper. Are you going deeper? Or have you normalized average and ordinary? Have you normalized? The second thing we need to look at here is what killed you? So first we, we're trying to assess, are we even alive? And if we are walking with normalization, that could be the culprit of what has killed the growth of what's killed the passion. What has robbed you of the joy, the passion, and the glory of God? For the audience that Peter is speaking to, notice that Peter says, return. Let me go back and read that again. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped out. So in context, the proper rendering of this phrase, let me put it in context, okay? The proper reading of this phrase is repent and in doing so, you will turn towards God. Okay? So that's actually how it how it's read out. It's not uh, repent and return, but repent and in doing so, you will return to God. Does that make sense? Okay, but I want to consider this, that many in that audience were, they were affiliated with Jesus. They were connected with Jesus. They, they were acquainted with Jesus. Some were his ex-disciples. It's entirely plausible that many were there. Many were there. In fact, that's the, that's the same crowd that cried out, crucify, crucify. So they know who Jesus was. John 6.53 is a powerful passage. Jesus thins out the crowd. It says, and Jesus said to them, Verily, I truly tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, this was a, a, a wild teaching that Jesus used to thin out the crowd or rubbed against the grain of a lot of people. And the Bible tells us that after that, many people departed because they said his teaching's too hard. What is he talking about? Is he talking about cannibalizing? It, it got weird for them. That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about you've got to receive the entirety of, of the Son of Man and, and talking about the giving up of his life. It was a deep teaching. Many didn't get it. And because of that, many departed from the faith in that moment. And I have to believe that among those who departed from the faith are among those who once followed him. It's a point where people began to follow him. People began to turn away. Why? Why did they turn away from him? Because Jesus disappointed them. Because Jesus didn't meet that thing. They thought, if I'm connected and you're going to become the king, or you're going to do this and you're going to do that, there was a disappointment from the faith because of the true communion that Jesus Christ was calling for. Look, let me say, I, I don't want you to miss this. You cannot miss this. In that instance, in John chapter 6, Jesus was calling for a true, deep communion with the people. It went over their heads, and because of that, many departed in disappointment. Jesus disappointed people. Don't be shocked by that. There are many people that thought, if I become a Christian, uh, that I'm, it's, life is going to look different. Or because I prayed the prayer, this is going to happen, or that's going to happen. Or because the prophet said this, and I'm interpreting God's word this way, that way, these things are going to happen. Jesus then doesn't act like they think he's supposed to act. He doesn't act according to their expectation. The Christianity has disappointed a lot of people. Maybe you feel like God has not done what you thought he would do. Peter's cry to the people is turn away, turn back to him, turn back, receive Christ for who he truly is, not for what you think he is, not, not, not just a good teacher, but who he truly is, the son of the living God. So where are the people in this, at, at this point? Well, they're, they're empty. They're going through dead practices. There's a lack of Christ, his presence in their midst. Routine has become so comfortable that it's afforded people to come and go without ever being met. My prayer is when people come to church, come to church and I pray that you'd be met by God so powerfully that you'd leave different, that you'd leave changed. But that's not what's happening. People are coming and going in the same situation and no solutions are ever met and sin is never confronted. In other words, 
the opportunity to repent and redirect my attention, my affection, and my life back to Christ and making him the Lord of my life, it's, it never happens. So we ask a couple of questions. Number one, are you alive to begin with? If so, what killed you? What robbed you of the presence? 2020, did Jesus disappoint you? Did the church disappoint you? Did, did you find out that your church or your pastor's uh, um, political leaning disappointed you or their mask policy disappointed you? Now you've lost your faith because you thought they were supposed to be a powerful man of God or a woman of God. You saw people get the vaccine and now you think this or you saw somebody not get the vaccine. And you, you know, before that it was people's diets. Somebody did the Daniel fast. Somebody was into keto. Somebody was in a paleo. And that was divisive. Look, the enemy's always looking for room and reasons to divide so that you'll be disappointed. And so that you'll believe Jesus didn't perform like you thought he should have. You don't believe Jesus did what you thought he should do. I believe the word of the Lord would come to you today and say, be revived. Be brought back to life today. Let the spirit of God come upon you and breathe revival fire back into your life. Return that times of refreshing will come once again. Where did you get off the path? Where did you get redirected? Has your religion become the religion of your expectation? Has your faith become a faith in the Jesus of your own making? I preached a few weeks ago on which Christ do you serve? The Christ of your imagination or the one seated in heavenly places that's calling you to be seated with him? We've got to get redirected back to the main thing. The Jesus who died, who loves you. He wants to visit you. He wants the Holy Spirit to come upon you. He wants to pour his life and his power and his presence back into my life and into yours. He wants us to walk in his, in his power and in his presence once again. And I believe it just requires us asking him. Saying, oh God, where did I get off course? 2020 was brutal. And 2021 is brutal. We took hits and we took losses. And among those losses was my passion. I believe God can restore that passion to you once again. What do you think? You think God can do it? If you think he can, if you think he can ignite the fires of revival to burn once again, why don't you lift up your hands right now and pray with me. Lord, visit me with your revival. Revive my heart once again. Revive me, oh God. I need your fire in my life. I need your passion in my life, God. I answer the first question. Was I ever alive to begin with? Well, the solution's gonna be the same, whether I was once alive or I need a touch of revival. I need you and I invite you into my life. Come and breathe upon me by the power of your Holy Spirit. Come and visit me with a revival fire. Bring me to life again, oh God, that my life will please you, that my heart will please you. King Jesus, I need you. I invite you in. Reestablish the Lordship. Forgive me for walking through just a, uh, the routines of religion and not walking after the life that comes from you. I've been distracted. I've been sidetracked and I don't want to do that anymore. I want you and you alone. Come and visit. Lord, your word says that you stand at the door and knock and if any man opens it or you'll come in and you will sup. Would you come in and sup with me? Fellowship. Come and sit at the table. Let's break bread together, right? Jesus, that's my invitation. Lord, I pray you would take me up on that. And the truth is, I take you up on your offer to open the door and to receive you today. And I receive you today in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to marinate here for just a moment because I believe there's a lot of you with, with greater need than just hearing a, a good message of, of uh, encouragement. I think you've, you've got some other needs going on. I think that you need a touch. I think that you need encouragement. I think some of you may even need some healing. So let's take a minute and let's invite the Lord to touch our bodies, to touch our minds, to touch our hearts, to touch our families. So whatever that need is right now, I, I invite you, you're welcome to type it in right now. I, if you're watching this in replay, that's all right. I'll go back later and I'll review it. And, and I, I, will, I will touch those things and pray with you and be in agreement for that marriage right now. In Jesus' name, Lord, touch the husband, touch the wife, uh, rekindle passion once again. But God, do a work 
that brings us closer ultimately to you. Father, to that loved one that's sick, Lord, to the ones battling COVID right now, to the ones battling mental health, uh, to the ones that are battling depression and anxiety, God, to the ones battling sickness and cancer. Father, touch your people. Revive us again, oh God. Father, I pray for the churches and the communities represented here. They need the visitation of your spirit. Lord, to the one that, that's hungry and thirsty for more of you, God, fill me with your spirit. Baptize me in the power of your presence. Baptize me. Let me be a, a walking, living, breathing example, a, a walking, breathing demonstration of you, that others would see you in my life, God. Oh, Father, to the ones that are in great economic need right now, they don't know how they're going to make ends meet. God, would you visit them, bless them, pour out your blessings in their life, God. Pay those bills that they don't know how they're going to be able to pay. And God, and give us peace in the waiting, in the waiting, in the waiting. We love you, we honor you, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for spending a few minutes with me. I want you to just really marinate on the idea of, of revival. Revive me once again. What robbed me of revival, what robs many people of revival is that false expectation. Uh, what am I doing this for? Why am I walking through this? Uh, we need to be reminded why we follow the, the, the God that we serve and the God who loves us. Why? Because he loves you, because he's with you, and he'll never leave you or forsake you. Huh. Thank you for spending some time with me. Until next time, God bless you. And I look forward to uh, to making connection with some of you. If you'd like to reach out, you can always reach me at pastor at gardencitychurch.net. Until next time, God bless you.